Hello, and welcome to Trust Your Sacred Feminine Flow. I'm your host, Joni Advent Maher, mystic, spiritual midwife, and visionary leadership guide. It's my great pleasure to share inspiring and intimate conversations and emerging wisdom gathered from our collective feminine journey of awakening. My guests are revolutionary women at the cutting edge of both personal and global transformation. I invite you to join us in claiming our sovereignty, changing the world, and flourishing no matter what. Welcome, beloved. I am so delighted you are here with us today. I have a special guest that I want to share with you. It's Helene Marie Anderson. Welcome, Helene Marie. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. So delighted to have you. And let me share a bit more about you and the wonder of what you bring to the world with our listeners. <laughs> so Helene Marie is a transformational voice coach. She's a singer, a pianist, a sound healer, a musician, composer, energy healer, author, multi-instrumentalist and teacher. And her unique style of working with sound blends her years of studying healing modalities with contemporary music and sound healing. Based on her unique journey through a performing arts career that eventually led her down her healing path, Helene's book and transformational voice program, You Are Meant to Sing, 10 Steps to Unlock Your Inner Voice, combines her training and background into focused work with the voice. The intention behind her programs is to create a space that allows people to step into their power and their purpose while connecting deeply with the voice through speaking, singing, and action. And LA Yoga Magazine says, Helene Marie sings like an angel, taking you into the celestial world with her voice paired with crystal singing bowls, chimes, and alchemical bowls. Welcome back, Helene Marie. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here and happy to be with all of you today. Yes, yes. So I reached out to you because I was so enthusiastic and excited to find your work. Really, the piece about using the voice and the power of our voice to reconnect with that place of power and purpose. So I would love I would love to just dive in there and, and say, how, how did you ever, how did you get to that? What, and I know that may be, <laughs> that may be a long answer. <laughs> the story or the long story? No, I just, <laughs> uh, well, let me just start by saying I, I've been a lifelong singer, a musician. I, I, I started piano actually fairly late. I started when I was 10 years old. And I always would sing. I sang in choir in my church growing up. And I loved singing in school. I was in choir. I wanted to perform. I wanted to play the piano. I wanted to do anything and everything musical that I could get my hands on. And my parents were not musical. Uh, and so they both took piano lessons growing up and hated it. So they weren't <laughs> going to let us take piano lessons. And so when I was 10, I pretty much told my parents that they could keep my allowance if they let me take piano lessons. So I was completely wow. like, self-motivated. <laughs> I, it was more my parents told me to stop playing rather than, you know, having to tell me to play and practice. So I was kind of the opposite child in that regard. So I would definitely had the draw towards music from a very young age. However, uh, with I had a challenging relationship with my mother. Both of my parents have passed at this point now, but, mm -hmm. uh, but my mother, she had a lot of stuff going on. I'll just say that. And, and really didn't know what to do with having such a creative child. And so mm -hmm. there was a, a lot of these elements in my voice that got very shut down. And even mm -hmm. though I, throughout, um, throughout 
high school, throughout college and beyond, I took voice lessons. I studied voice lessons. My, my bachelor's degree is in piano performance and I studied voice too, all, all through school. Uh, there was always a part of me that felt disconnected from my actual instrument. And then when I, I would sing on and off in choirs when I lived in New York City and I still kept that going, but there was always a part of me that felt disconnected from my actual voice. And meaning that I was technically singing in a certain way and, mm -hmm. and that, but I was disconnected from the real truth of the soul part of my voice. And so I went through my own spiritual evolution and journey and it was preempted after my father passed away in 2007 that really I was in a very high level position at the Los Angeles Philharmonic working with the orchestra and the Hollywood Bowl. And I realized that I was deeply unhappy and there was so much of who I was that couldn't be expressed in that job, but it was a highly coveted job. And, mm -hmm. and so I had this, this real battle internally of where I was exercising my voice in the way that wasn't actually going to help the most of the people I was meant to help. And, and it was a very long journey because I defined myself so much by my job. So it was like a major shift for me to, uh, and it was a process because I had a consulting business for a while that helped me make the transition, but it was everything that I teach, everything that I guide people through is, has been something that I've done myself. Mm -hmm. So in terms of really going deep into what this means, how can I help people get to the empowerment part of their voice quicker? And also I think the realization that a lot of us when we feel disempowered or we feel out of alignment with the life we've created for ourselves, it's because there's an element of the voice that hasn't been expressed fully yet or the voice is out of alignment. And so my work is really about bringing it into alignment because the voice itself is the breath. We live based on the breath. Mm -hmm. Everything with singing, everything in the vibration of the voice, it's all from the breath and the breath comes from yes the air that comes into the lungs but the diaphragm is the muscle that controls or the breath right it's an involuntary mm -hmm. muscle most of the time because we don't think about breathing but when you do yoga practices or pranayama or sing the, you use the breath in different ways for all of those things and so when you start to strengthen it and it literally is in the solar plexus area it's it's that area right that's where the diaphragm is and that is the solar plexus is the power center it's where all the power comes from so a lot of times i've found when people have had really severe trauma um, whether physical, emotional, mental, physical. And I think on some level as humans, we all have some trauma. And so when the pieces of the voice get shut down, there's stuff that gets stuck. So it's from that somatic experience. And so when you start to like really go deeper into these exercises of opening the diaphragm and connecting with the breath and stepping into that, uh, there are a lot of what happens with trauma is that oftentimes parts of the person, the spirit, whatever, leave the body. That's what happens because that's how they cope. And I was also that I went through a lot of that myself. And so this, this uh, awareness of how much of my life I spent in the astral body and then bringing it back into the body, you can't actually affect change in this dimension, like as a human, unless you're in your body, if you're always outside of your body. And that's the thing with some of the spiritual circles that they don't always address being in the body. It's great to have these other experiences and, yes. and, and that, which is awesome. And I've had many of them, but if you're not physically present in your actual body in this moment in time, in this dimension, as like a human, where you're living, in this <laughs> second, you can't, you can't um, change and shift things around you. It's like you have to be in your body. And so this embodiment of the voice, this transformation, and mm -hmm. the other piece of that is that there is a lot of, if you've had really significant trauma or things in your life that have happened. And it doesn't actually have to be trauma. It can be something that seems small, 
seems small in the mind, but it can be just as much as like one thread of, of where your voice is or a judgment about your own voice. So, so it doesn't have to be something big, but I'm just using that as an example that when you have that trauma, sometimes it's like, people don't want to come back in the body because then it's painful, right? And you have to feel through the feelings to get to the other side. So in my own experience, it's been much more beneficial and healing when I've had a witness or I've had someone to hold that space for me. So in essence, it's holding the space for the release of whatever it is that feels scary to give that safety. And I do most of my, like now I've been doing all my sessions on Zoom and it's actually, I find almost more effective than when doing it in person because you're not relying mm -hmm. on that it's almost like from the energetic perspective there's this ability to really tap in energetically and my work is very much stemmed in the intention that i want to empower people i don't want clones i don't want like people that are <laughs> gonna you know sing like me or necessarily i want them to sing with their voice mm -hmm. not my voice and i think there's a lot of having been a product of the classical music system, there's a lot of teaching that is teaching people to play like you or sing like you or be like you. And, and, mm -hmm. and I, I, I just don't subscribe to that way of being anymore. It's very much, I want people to play like them. Yeah. And everyone has their own voice. So it's like cultivating that. So I've had people that do my my program and then they feel complete. And then I've had people that um, work with me for a lot longer. It really depends on each person, but there's like that, you know, taking my life experience, it took years to figure some of the stuff out and really condensing it to a program that I feel like I can help people get there faster. It just can be kind of intense in the middle, but it's like, it's, it's a way of like, okay, let's get the timeline so that you don't have to spend so much time. But I've, I find, Mm. That sort of auspicious number of what is, you know, for years, I didn't invent the 40 days. That's, that's forever, right? Like that's ancient wisdom that if you chant the mantra, the 108 times for 40 days, that you will reprogram something in your neural brain. But it takes that time because there's a clearing of everything that's been blocking it before it gets to the other side. And that's the space that I think is important to hold for people because if they feel like they have someone that can support what's happening and they understand what's happening, because I didn't have that. And, and so it, there was a lot of stuff that was happening that if I had just had somebody that took the time to really go into explaining what was happening with the process, then I think I, it would have happened sooner for me too. So I feel like that's part of my purpose with that. Yes, you were, <clears throat> excuse me, you were the pioneer. And so you were, it sounds like you were doing that on your own. And yeah. it, it's that whole social nervous system piece that I'm hearing you refer to because we have our individual nervous system, but we have that mirroring that we do for each other and holding uh, holding a container that allows for us to emerge or to blossom. So for sure. Yes. yes. Very excited about everything you're talking about, the embodiment piece. Absolutely. In fact, I was going to ask about the name of your business or your website, Sacral Sounds. Yes. Um, is it is it related like to say you know to the sacrum as in yes yeah <laughs> sacral chakra i'm uh well i mean the sacral chakra is connected to sexuality and creativity it's mm -hmm. like where all everything is born from the sacral chakra like right yes so yes. anything of the music anything of the sound i've had a real journey myself in that department that mm -hmm. you know is like that ongoing healing process and so there's something about um that process and when i came up with the name i actually had a friend and we were doing a brainstorm that we ended up with this name because i also am a, a i mean i'm a trained massage therapist but really i do much more mm. craniosacral therapy mm -hmm, at mm -hmm. this point like and 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 so i don't do so much of that anymore but i use those techniques when i'm working with people with the voice and so the craniosacral therapy really informs the work wow. i'm doing yes. and so um and so at that time, 
when I came up with the name, which was about six and a half years ago now, I, I realized like I wanted, I was playing around because I was doing more craniosacral work at that time. It was at least mm -hmm. half, mm -hmm. if not more of what mm -hmm. my, my work was because I was just starting to do more with the sound and the voice at that point in this capacity. Of course, I always tell people ask me how long I've been doing it. And I was like, you know, I've, I'm a, I'm a lifelong musician. I've been like trained. So it's, it's more just incorporating all these healing tools into the space. Um, so there was something about playing around with the word of the craniosacral, right? And then it came up, okay, where do they come together? And then it was sacral sounds, but it was also the sacral chakra. And when that name kind of came out, it was very clear that, oh, no, that feels grounded. It feels grounded in like just the name and also grounded in all the elements of what I do, because it's also... Yeah the the producing the sound healing recordings and doing the live streams and doing the meditation and doing this it all feels like it's coming from my creative center so that's mm. like the very clear intention and i just redid my website and my logo too so it's like i had a really brilliant artist that helped me in 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 uh in vision and yes. you know, her vision really matched what i had in my head which you know i'm always grateful when that happens <laughs> <laughs> Abs know? absolutely and I think about the pelvic bowl, like the sacrum and the pelvic bowl. And I know you work with the, the bowls and the sound healing. So it's, it's like all the synergy of that is, is very, very potent. Oh, yes. Yeah. And I, I wanted to share, I am working with the mantra because I, I, huh. I tried that out and it's interesting. Um, just what comes up as you move through that. and. And even settling on like what is the right mantra, and and so I don't know if if you have anything even to say about your experience. If you want to share a little bit about that, uh, I, 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 I look at it as um, I don't know. It's, it's it seems like a funny word, but it makes sense in the Western context, like a prescription, right? Like mm -hmm. I have, I have. Um, the first session when I work with people in terms of the program, I send I, this guided meditation that I actually recorded right at the beginning, the first time I did this program four years ago. And, um, and I, I, when, as I was developing how it was laid out and, you know, mm -hmm. the way that it would unfold for people. And the one thing that came up for me was this, um, uh, idea with the mantra I, I recorded this guided meditation so i send it to people ahead of time and i ask that they listen to it more than once it's short mm -hmm. it's probably like six minutes or something but it kind of it starts the inquiry mm -hmm. into the essence of where they are in that moment and what their real intention is with clearing their voice so it's very, and it's always different, right? And and I have some people that have worked with me that they like, they want to do this mantra and then this mantra and then this one. And I, I kind of encourage people to do one at a time, especially when they're just getting started because yeah. it can be really intense. Like some of the people I've worked with like have these clearings and they're just sort of shocked. I tell them all at the beginning, I said, <laughs> when you start doing this, like life's going to bring you the things to clear, like just so you know. And they're always kind of like, whoa, I didn't even, know <laughs> that was coming right and which is fun to watch too right uh and so then we spend a lot of the first session which is also coming from like my years of training with the craniosacral work which also included a lot of like communication and polarity therapy and that so it's very much stemmed in in getting to the essence of like what is the real essence of what it is you're calling in based on all of these elements of where you are in your spiritual process your mental process your emotional process and and i'd say 50 percent of the time it's something that uh we create together that the client and i create together or i will give suggestions based on okay this is how we can word it and you know i work with a lot of people that are not native english speakers too so i i encourage them in terms of you can say this in english or you can say it in your native language i really whatever resonates with you the most. And then I'd say the other half of the people, it ends up being a Sanskrit mantra that, that is the best 
for what they're going through or mm -hmm. a Ho'oponopono or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. something. It just depends like each person where they are in their process of like what that essence is of where they're going next with their voice and what they're mm -hmm. calling in. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there's something about that reflection of, and you know, and I'm actually in the process now of doing a course so that I go, I'm going deeper into the Indian music myself, just so that I feel like I have even, even deeper understanding of a lot of these things as well. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, cause it's really important to, and to know and understand the energy of all of these things and what it is you're really working with. Right. The seed syllables and, and what yeah. they, what the transmission is that's coming through them. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't give anyone any mantra that I'm not aware of, like the full on meaning and what sure. they are necessarily. It's, it's just, um, uh, but yeah, but no, just going deeper into like um, studying with someone that is Indian that I'm going, uh, okay, just like my layer of like knowledge and deepening my own layers of knowledge beyond what I've learned already. Yeah, I think that's important. We all continue to do that because that's how we show up as like better practitioners, as better teachers, as better whatever, is that we can all delve into our process to learn. Absolutely. So I would love to talk about the idea that everyone is a singer because there may be women listening who think, you know, what does this have to do with me? I'm not a singer. <laughs> I don't want to be a singer. Um, so what do you what do you have to say to that or about that? <laughs> well, I would say first of all, everyone really is a singer because I don't know that there's anyone that doesn't at least sing with the radio or in the shower or sing to themselves or hum or something like I, I don't really know anyone that doesn't even my <laughs> grandmother who was a little bit tone deaf like she, she could still <laughs> sing. So I think the point is is that it's not so much like. You don't have like a lot of people. I have some people who work with me that are like singers that really want to like really connect with their voice more deeply and are professional singers. And then I have people who work with me that don't really like to sing at all. And they don't, you know, and so it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, really? Yeah. But they feel like there's a blockage in their throat. Like there's, okay. there's like, cause it's also like what's clearing if they feel speaking wise, they feel like they have a block where they feel like they can't speak their truth or something is mm -hmm. happening. And it's really, um for that you don't have to be a singer it's but the vibration of the voice and the exercises that i do with people are very much about how you can actually use your voice to heal yourself you never have to go sing a song in public that's not what it's about if you if that's your intention mm -hmm. then if i'm working privately with the people the the nature of those sessions go a different direction than if i'm working yes. with someone that like is just moving to speak their truth and it's just it's just different because it depends on each person and where they are and what they're what's unfolding for them and their process so um hmm. so yes i believe everyone is a singer and i believe that we have this instrument that's healing and powerful regardless of what we judge as the state of our instruments because if you really look at any indigenous culture everyone sings yeah, everyone does something music. like there's no it's like you might have the people it's like why does the medicine man have that role in an indigenous community that he's the medicine person because that's his path and that's his role but that doesn't mean that like other people are not learning and and participating and mm -hmm. in in the case of like the singers you might have the people that lead that are like the the, the tribal people that lead but everyone joins in because it's about a vibration it's about this collective and you don't have to even sing the mantra if you do it you can speak it it's still the vibration of the voice and just the pure like resonant chamber of the voice is this um mm -hmm. element that we all have mm -hmm. yes we do we do thank you you're welcome so if you're <clears throat> if you're open to talk um about the mom daughter thing because i know I, I i share with you the uh I, I read at the beginning of your book that you dedicate it to your mom as your greatest teacher I did, yes. And I, I have a similar history for similar reasons. Um, I don't know that our mothers were exactly the same, but the, the chemistry of 
my full expression and and her being were um i would say comparable in the way that it was a uh thwarting that spurred on my growth and and i i have a daughter as well and she similar to you has that desire to be a performer that desire to be out in the open and so it's it's just fascinating to me kind of being in the center because now i say the two of them are my <laughs> my greatest teachers she as being so um kind of willing to be out there and I, i'm just aware of my own uh, issues around visibility and i don't know if like the visibility and the voice have gone together whether it's with the people you work with or that similar ma message i i know certainly in my own history there i would say was a multi-generational legacy of the women in the family like tamping down the women in the family so i i'm not sure what my question is it's just more Kind of dropping that into the field because my guess is is that there are women who are listening who have who are on both sides of that equation who are mothers who are daughters i mean i I'm just thinking how to respond since yeah it wasn't a direct question i can say i mean just for everybody who's listening my mother my mother had bipolar disorder and mm -hmm. It was a very challenging relationship. Um, and my mother was very stuck in her childhood wounding and never recovered from it. Mm -hmm. And so um, she behaved often like a child and it was a very challenging thing because there's a lot of societal judgment around, um, it's your mother, so you should <laughs> have a relationship. It's your mother, you should feel a certain way, like it's mm -hmm. your mother. and and i very much come from like giving people permission to feel how they feel with whatever yeah because when if anyone was close to things that happened uh i think people would judge less because it's kind of if if you're treated a certain way even if the person is your mother there's no, like my mother and I never had safety. We never had emotion. I never had emotional safety with her. And so even when I, you know, started setting boundaries, like really, really hard boundaries on and off for the last 20 years with her, like before she, she passed away three and a half years ago and she didn't really take care of herself either. And so it was a very challenging thing. And, and she was on and off of medication. And when she did take her medication, um she was it was easier but then mm -hmm. towards the end she she didn't and then i had to set a clear boundary that i couldn't we can't have a relationship if you're gonna go to the darker places again because i've had enough and so i think mm -hmm. the hardest thing for other people to understand is that that boundary is actually necessary because there's sort of that um in order to preserve your own health. And I think it's hard to do because it's a very complicated, it's a very complicated thing. So I just encourage people to be really compassionate about people if they have challenges with their parents because you never really know someone's journey. And I think it's really important to not discount or project your own experience if you had a very loving emotionally available supportive mother onto somebody that didn't have that because you actually don't know what that's right. like and so i think the the biggest piece of advice is just to own your feelings and it's okay and 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 giving permission if you need to set a boundary with a family member and it's not just that some people have to set boundaries with their children some people have to set boundaries with their spouse some people have to set set boundaries with things that and these are never easy like right. none of these circumstances are easy right i mean just because someone has a child and their child might struggle with addiction it doesn't mean it was the parent's fault right sometimes it's the journey of that soul of that person right and so i imagine i i'm not a parent myself but i imagine and have seen where it's very challenging because there's a lot of 
blaming yourself. And it's the same if you have a difficult parent, the child tends to blame themselves, which is what I did for years. And it really, so I think if there's any spiritual lesson in that, and for anybody that's listening is to be kind and be really, be kind, be compassionate, and just really know that you actually can never really 100% know another human. Mm -hmm because we all have our own experiences. We all have our own way of dealing things. We all have our own way of processing information. And we may find people we're really similar with, but there's that real relationship is when we can accept that person as they are, because no matter what the relationship, whether it's mother, daughter, like relationship, romantic relationship, you know, mother, son, like son, you know, just siblings, friendships, work relationships. Mm -hmm. We're never going to be able to 100% know every single thing that's going on in another person's being or the truth of every single thing that they went through. Sure. So I think that, you know, in those moments where we have to set boundaries with people, I think that's probably the hardest thing to do in any kind of relationship is setting boundaries because we're not really taught that either in standard way of growing up at least not in the united states like i don't you know my mom did not like boundaries when i when we set them with her she was like no what is this thing you know <laughs> boundaries i and so i just think like that and the more you can also like what you had mentioned just to come bring this around full circle about her being my greatest teacher it's that for sure, it's the difficult relationships that teach us forgiveness, that teach us compassion, that teach us um, deeply about who we are as people. They teach us how to dive in. They actually teach us what love actually is or is not, right? Like, and, mm -hmm. and so this idea is that the the easy, if we only had easy relationships in our life, we would never evolve and grow. So this idea that the difficult relationships are the ones that are there so that we can step into a new way of being. Yes, I, I agree. And they do uh, foster sometimes through the crucible or the pressure. For sure. Dimensions or aspects of us coming out that never would have been there. For in, sure. Uh, under, under other circumstances. So the, the piece that I, that kind of pinged when you were speaking was the emotional safety. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine the necessity of emotional safety to free the voice. For sure. And that's yeah. like one of the primary things is that I, I tell people I work with, like, like nothing scares me really. Like I'm like, yeah, whatever thing you've gone through, like you're not going to scare me. Like, and and I think it's this element, but I've gone that deep with myself to release mm -hmm. these things. And so, and I also feel like if you're doing any kind of this, this type of work, this energy healing or like working deeply with the voice or working deeply with like any kind of coaching work or something, if you haven't done the work yourself, like you're just not going to have that same level of integrity, right? It's, it's, mm -hmm. and it's also just a deep understanding, right? Because when I tell people, even when I was doing the body work, and now I just do it on more subtle levels, but I'm kind of doing the same thing. It's like the, you know, the sensitivity of being a classical pianist and having my fingers like be mm. really sensitive. I can touch people and know what's grief and know what's sadness and know what's love and know what's stuck and know what's, you know, why? Because it's a vibration. I, I can feel the vibration and I'm fine tuned to knowing what the vibration is. So it's the same thing yeah. with stepping into the voice of like being fine tuned that I know when that person's holding rage or I know when that person is holding anger, I know the stuck thing in the voice. And, and it's so, I mean, one of my clients asked, she said, well, do you do just like intuitive readings? And I, <laughs> I, I said, well, I, I do it in a context of empowerment with people. So it's, I, I, I don't like to call it that because when I get the intuitive things, it's because it's very direct alignment to help this person through their process and not something where I'm trying to tell someone what to do. So I'm giving them hope for the future or something like that. You know, it's, it's a very different energy when you say it's yes. one thing as the other. And I'm very clear that, it's definitely when I work with people, it's part voice, 
coaching. It's mm-hmm. part energy healing. It's part intuitive reading. It's part like craniosacral work that I'm doing. It's all of those things. And then mm-hmm. when people go further and they really want to focus on singing, mm-hmm. I am a classical singer and I right. sing lots of things. And then we do get into vocal technique. That is part of it. Yes. Right. But this initial stage is like the clearing of anything that's blocking the voice from its full expression first. Yeah. So it strikes me that perhaps part of like part of our evolution these days in, in terms of humanity is really reclaiming this in a conscious way. And I'm, I have my hands on my throat, um, reclaiming the voice, reclaiming the power, we'll say of the fifth chakra, so to speak, and using it with much more consciousness and awareness. So it seems to me that you are, you are at the forefront of fostering that, of oh, thank you. invoking that in letting people know this matters. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I feel really strongly and I'm, you know, super grateful for all of my teachers that it's like kind of come into this space, right? Because, um, however, what I'm doing, there are bits and pieces of what I'm doing that other people, like, I Mm -hmm. might have picked up here or there. We're all like conglomerates of like everything we've learned. But the approach of really getting clear into that segment like where is the voice where does it need to like move where does it mm-hmm. need to like go into this next space for sure i feel like it is super important and i feel like it's super important that people feel safe to express their truth where they are and we're living in such a weird time right now i i mean i don't really for lack of a better word in this moment but i mean things are really very chaotic in the world at the moment. And that's sort of an understatement of the year, but <laughs> I, think, um, I think this element of we're all being asked to stand up for what we believe in, and it can be really uncomfortable because when you do that, and I think this is where there's a lot of fear, even with mm-hmm. the singing piece, yes. is that when you start really living and speaking your truth, the systems that have been at play in your life will start to break down. Yes. And so that's the piece that I totally now understand. And if people come and they say they want to work with me, but they're not quite ready, I just trust they're not ready yet. And it's fine because everyone has their own timeline. They're going to be ready to do the work when they're ready to do the work. And I'm totally okay with that. I'm, I'm not a pressure cooker. I don't like to do the kind of salesy thing. It's like, this is what it is. When you're ready to go, we'll go. And if you're not ready, then I trust that's not the right time. Yeah, and it's yeah. really important because there is that element where I tell people uh, that some of your relationships will change. Like I can guarantee you when you start to go through because, and I've had this happen multiple times where I've had and lost, well, I say lost, I've just like friendships that just didn't resonate anymore. And it's happened a lot actually over the last 10 years where I've had things that were otherwise close friendships that just like completely severed. And it wasn't even, they become less and less dramatic as it happens because you just sort of see that, the relationship itself was stemmed in a pattern that was stemmed in a wounding. And when you come to terms, that's why I say like the greatest teacher, right? Of the difficult relationships. When you come to terms and you see that this pattern was based in a childhood wound or a trauma wound or something, then the relationship itself, it doesn't, some relationships can move past that and move into a higher space. And I have had like friendships that have done that even after like, hardly speaking for a year and then coming back and being in this higher vibrational space with them. So that is also possible. And there you can be deep healing and deep unfolding of um, love and relationships. And then you might have other people that just, some people come in for a season, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and it's accepting that, which for somebody like me, that's a Scorpio and super loyal was like really challenging part of the process because it's hard for me to let people go. And Mm. so I, it's been that process of realizing, but every time I've gotten more and more clear when something has done its time, 
I honestly, this window opens and all of these new people come into that space that are more aligned with where I am now. Yeah. So I think that's the flip. If you can make it where you're able to go through, that's why I call it like the transformation. There's a piece of it where things shift. And it may be that all of your relationships just shift because if you've never set boundaries in a relationship and all of a sudden you start setting boundaries, that person's going to have their own reaction. That's not. And, Absolutely. And, and they may or may not be ready to meet you in that new space. And so you have to just accept that when you speak that and when you speak your truth, you also can, you can trigger people, even though that's not your intention. Your intention is to speak from your heart. But sometimes when you sh start showing up and you start shining your light, actually, mm. it can bring up this stuff in other people. And this is the harder stuff sometimes of the transformational process. But if you understand that that's what's happening and you really know it's, it, it is actually, it doesn't make it easy, but it does make it easier because there is that side to it where there's this evolutionary process of just the most high forms of love and experiences and connection and all of these deeper things that are just it's just like pulling out the weeds in the garden. Sometimes it just, and it doesn't mean anything's bad about any people. It just means that, it just means that some people are going to resonate with you throughout your life. And some people will resonate for a time. Some people will resonate and then they come back again, like, because yes. they've done their work over here. I've had all of these experiences and they've all been beautiful. And during this quarantine, it's been really interesting to me the people mm -hmm. like from my past that have come back into alignment with me now. And, and it's been really beautiful process of like even the newer people just elevating to this other space of being and fun. And like, mm -hmm. I, I just, I, I really encourage people because the, the real beauty of the evolution is deeper and deeper connection with yourself and the voice can empower all of these things. Yes. That coupled with creating, as you said, like creating your life, your relationships externally, things in a different way. Absolutely. So I mean, it really is. You start to do this and then you create the next level vibrationally of what it is that you are calling in. And we often, I, I also go through this. So I just am encouraging people whenever I'm entering in, which I have been recently, like stepping into a new evolution with my own work, mm -hmm. there's always a bit of fear to work through and yes. a bit of security to work through. It doesn't go away. You just have more tools to be able to step into the space and be like, okay, this thing, like we're coming <laughs> up again. Okay, I see you, but you don't have control this time, right? It's kind of, you change the dialogue where you almost make it funny because then when you, when you can laugh about it and you see it for what it is, then you can shift into Oh, you stop expecting. I, one friend of mine, when I lived in New York years ago, and she's a classical cellist, and I remember she said this to me, and I just take her words of wisdom. And she said, My life got a lot easier when I stopped expecting it to be easy. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is brilliant. So it's about like, we're, we're in this human space. It's, it, we're going to have hard moments. Things are going to happen. We're not in control of all of the external forces, but we are in control of our own way of responding to things. If we can hone in on our own emotional landscape and develop the tools of when we feel off, what do we do about it? So yes. it's, it's about, that's the evolution is that we're able to observe things and see the cosmic joke and the things that even are hard as opposed <laughs> to as opposed to living in the world where everything is challenging. Yes. The narrative. What is the <laughs> what is the narrative All we're the attaching? Narrative <laughs> yeah. And how we tell the story and I emphasize that so much. Like I even was talking to my my cousin who I love so much and she was referring to something about uh, something being horrendous. And I said, well, maybe you just say like that revelation will be enlightened. And she's like, oh my gosh, you're so right. Like you have to, yes, I gotta like change that word. And it really is like, if we keep telling this word, 
Yeah. And we keep living it. And I, I still have to catch myself on some stories. You know, it's, it's more just like, oh, okay, you again. And like, okay, this isn't working. We're going to do right. this. Like, you know, and it's almost this, this, um, what I always, I, I, I write about in the book, but the Fred Flintstone, I have the angel on one shoulder and the <laughs> devil on the other. And it's like, okay, which one's going to be louder right now? And which one are you going to listen to? And we all have our little inner, inner dialogue that happens that way and that's that's a lot of what I address with people too is the inner dialogue and really understanding whose voices they really are and then coming down to which voice is actually yours yes and I know we we're getting to the point we need to wrap it up but I actually have one more question for you and it relates to kind of the there is a trend to use affirmation and I want to ask you what do you what's your perception about like what's the difference between affirmation and using words and voice in that way as opposed to say the mantra for example or do you understand what I'm getting at it's I th okay. it feels like something's missing to me just with the affirmation process uh I mean I think you can look at it as a mantra is a type of affirmation. Yes. Uh, so in terms of differentiation, if your affirmation is just, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy. And you keep saying that, but you're not addressing what's underneath. Yes. Then, then you may never like the feeling in the word might vibrationally not match. match. Uh, however, I, it's just, it's just different because if, if, if I was saying that with a mantra for somebody, I would be like, I embody the energy of happiness in everything I do. Yes. Right. Yeah. That's more of a mantra, right. As opposed to the affirmation, because it's like, I, it's the embodiment, like I, and I love using the word embody for yes. some, like a lot of people, yes. I use that with them, but it's this element where you're taking in this energy of happiness what is that because mm -hmm. i'm happy is also like well if i don't feel happy you know it's 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 a i i guess it's 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 kind of a more complicated question i, I and there could be an <laughs> argument that they're the same they're one in the same in a way but that it depends on what the affirmation would be and if it's simple and if the underlying reason why that isn't hasn't happened yet is being addressed and that so i but but i do think because yes. i do think affirmations are also powerful and when you're yes. like in sports medicine and stuff and i just signed up to train for the half marathon uh, last week so i start training <laughs> tomorrow but this idea that you're setting the intention of this is the time and this is what it is and i right. am aligned and i am aligned I, so and the mindset yeah, the mindset work so they can be also a type of mantra like so it really depends i think it's more if you're seeing them as separate i don't know that they're entirely separate i just think when you're doing a mantra it's specific you're doing something for yourself the 108 times a day it's a very mm -hmm. like practice that's very specific when your affirmation you're saying it in relation to this actual moment or actual thing, you it's, maybe you say it the whole time you're running, the whole time. It's just a different energy around how it's generally referred to. Yes, and I, I think as you were talking, I realized that it really is the willingness to lean into or face into what is under underlying or what is it that's keeping you from living that experience that that is the piece that I'm seeing as not that affirmation doesn't allow for that. I believe sometimes it's used in the way, almost like a magic pill where you get to skip the messy parts. <laughs> and I, I'm hearing you say that, no, the messy parts are part of it. You know, we have yeah. to. Yeah. I think it's, it's all in, it's like everything, everything is interpretation and semantics. So yeah. it depends on, you know, the interpretation and, and the usage of it and how it's being used and how the person's interpreting it. And so that's why, you know, in terms of 
everybody really, we are all connected, but we are also all individuals. And so it's, it's uh, really just depends on the person and the intention behind it. The same way anything is, is like, if you think of like yoga and how many different teachers and lineages there are, and some people who've used it to very destructive ways and people who've used it for super healing ways. So it depends on the individuals that are doing it and what their own intention is around it. And so I would say that rather than more of an all encompassing, it really just depends on the circumstances and the person. Yes. Well, I appreciate you entertaining the question with me and, and just going down that path. I like to figure things out and to... I appreciate that too. <laughs> yes. I like to understand how it all works, even though we, we can't necessarily understand how it all works, but you know what I mean. I do know what you mean. So I appreciate that. Yes. So we do need to bring this to a close and I want to share with my listeners all the ways that they can access your work and your offerings. And I know you have a number of pieces. So I know you have a few sound healing recordings that people can access. I do. And I, I do have a Spotify page that is oh, accessible yeah. under Helene Marie Anderson and it's all uh, three of my sound healing albums are there. And I have some recordings up on my YouTube space that's also Sacral Sounds, and uh, all are accessible through my website, which is the sacralsounds.com. And I often, I post about my live streams and stuff on Instagram mostly, which mm -hmm. is at Sacral Sounds LA. So that's a good way to reach me. Wonderful. And you have a free gift as well. I do. I, so I'm giving everybody that... Um, sends me an email today, a free PDF of my book, You Are Meant to Sing, 10 Steps to Unlock Your Inner Voice. And I also, for anyone that is interested in learning more or connecting with me directly, I offer 15-minute discovery calls as well for free. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I'm so delighted to have you be here today and to talk with us and share your wisdom and, and what you're doing. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Yes, likewise, my, my pleasure as well. And I'm just excited for what you're bringing to the world. And I do hope that uh, our listeners will, will tune in and take advantage of it. Yeah, me too. I look forward to hearing from everyone. Yes. And I want to thank you, dear listener, for being with us, as always, and to remind you to always trust what your heart knows. Thanks for listening to Trust Your Sacred Feminine Flow. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend and be sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. And visit theradianceequation.com to receive your copy of The Radiance Equation, a visionary's guide to coming out of hiding, owning your wisdom, and creating your greatest impact.